We're going to start there in Isaiah chapter number 8. In verse number 18 it says, Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts which dwelleth in Mount Zion. And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead? To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. The Bible's saying right there that the children of Israel were going unto, where did he come from? That's crazy. <laughs> we're going unto, this is an Alberto. And then, <laughs> that the children of Israel were going and seeking familiar spirits. They were going to wizards. They were actually going to the dead. They were praying to the dead. When they shouldn't have just been seeking the Lord. Now, what I'm going to be, go to Exodus chapter number 20. Exodus chapter number 20. And what I'm going to be preaching about tonight is the heresy of the Roman Catholic Church. The heresy of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, I remember even, I mean, old sermon CDs that I used to get of old time preachers, whether you disagree with them or not. You know, they used to preach against the Roman Catholic Church all the time. But in 2016, it seems like the church, the sermons against the Roman Catholic Church and just exposing the heresy of the, the Pope and, and their whole like structure-based system. I mean, it's just kind of gone by the wayside. People have assumed that because it's been preached about so often, that people, that Christians just know that the Roman Catholic Church is a wicked organization. But Christendom, you know, Christendom, false Christianity really has, and you know, churches that would say that they are Christian have the name Christian. Nowadays, they are just linking up with them in this whole just, you know, one, you know, everything, everything is good. We all worship the same God type mentality, this ecumenical movement that's going down right now. And the Catholic Church is on a PR like crusade to try to bring people back. The Roman Catholic Church in the in the world is on the decline. There, my parents are still Roman Catholics. They still go to Roman Catholic Church. The majority of my family go to a Roman Catholic Church, and the pa the priests and that come through there that are at the church there in Grand Junction, Colorado. They're from the they're from Uganda. They're from South America. They're from all sorts of parts of the world. And the, and the, my dad was telling me that they're preaching this like. We need to raise our children to go up to want to be priests because children nowadays in the Catholic Church are not wanting to, to grow up to be priests. They're actually leaving and they're going to these non-denominational type churches. And I mean, praise the Lord for that. That's like one step in the right direction. So, the Roman Catholic Church, to try to stop the decline and try to increase the amount of uh, members that they have, are going on this crusade to try to just kind of be like the world and bring people in. And I'm going to expose them and explain to you how bad they really are. Is there anybody here that has never been to a Catholic church? Anybody? The majority. If you walked into a Catholic church and went through their one of the ceremonies, you would think it's one of the most bizarre, one of the weirdest just ceremonies, the rituals, what they do. You would just be blown away by what they do. And then especially when you're taught why they're doing what they're doing. Now, number one, I'm going to talk about is idol worship. Now right there right, right where you had in Isaiah chapter 8 it says, if they speak not according to this word is because there is no light in them. Let me say this, there is no light inside the Roman Catholic Church. There is no light in the Pope. He is full of darkness. He's a false prophet. He's a wicked and evil person. And, and odds are the guy's a child molesting pervert and he's a pedophile and so is every, every single Catholic priest. They're all a bunch of wicked people, and most of them are reprobate. To say that they're all reprobate, I'd say, would be a false assumption, because I'm sure there's probably a few that might be able to be saved, but for the most part, they are evil, and they're wicked people that are doing things with an agenda. Now, look at Exodus chapter number 20. Now, idol worship, part, part, part number one is they worship idols. They worship statues. They pray to statues. Every good Roman Catholic has tons of statues. Now this idol worship varies from this from whatever type of Roman Catholic they are. You know, like uh, how we were raised in the church that we went to. You know, I think maybe we had a statue of we never my my, my dad growing up never had statues of Mary. He had some crucifixes and the the rosary. But I know this that when you get into like like people that are more Hispanic, in the Roman Catholic Church, they're a lot bigger on Mary worship in Phoenix, Arizona. 
people out in their front yard. We got one of them in my neighborhood. But it was more common that every four or five houses you go to, they, in the front yard, they actually have a big stone where they build like an altar to a Mary and they'll have liquor bottles out there. They'll have all sorts of stuff out there. And they actually literally pray to statues. And if you have a statue in your home, they'll make candles and they'll make a little altar and they will pray to the statue. Now, look at Exodus 20, verse number four. It says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is under the water or in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So in verse number four, he says, not to make a graven image or any likeness. You say, what is a graven image? It's, it's carving or molding uh, stone, wood, or metal into a likeness, which is a similitude, look at this, of anything that is in heaven above, that is in the earth beneath, or that is under the, or in the water under the earth. No fish, no animals, no people, no birds flying around in the air, nothing. And he takes it a step farther right there. He says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord God, am a jealous God. And these people will do idol worship. Now go in your Bibles. You're in Exodus chapter number 20. Actually, go to Exodus chapter number 32. Exodus chapter number 32. Now right here, the scripture, first off, they start, uh, it starts telling one of the first commandments is not to make a graven image and not to worship and serve other gods. Now all throughout history, all throughout the Bible, false religions were, were made graven images and were made they made idols to worship. And the Roman Catholic Church is really like a combinement of voodoo and a combinement of a whole bunch of different types of religions. And we'll get on, get into that more. Now, one of the things that surprises me about the Roman Catholic Church, and when I really started reading the Bible, is I realized that when you read the Ten Commandments, I mean, it's there in black and white where it says not to make any graven images. It says not to make anything likeness and not to bow down and worship them. And you wonder how this whole religion that will call themselves Christian could get up and build little Mary statues. They build uh, statues of the saints. They build necklaces with little graven and molded images on them for them to pray. And, and they worship and they kiss and they do their, you know, their... Oh, you know, my head, my stomach, where's my smokes, you know? <laughs> they say they're yabba dabba doos. And, they, and you wonder, how can these people do something so foreign to Scripture? Well, it's because, like in Isaiah chapter 8, there is no light in them. They do not preach and teach the Word of God by any means at the Roman Catholic Church. Is there anybody in here that was raised Catholic? We were raised in a Catholic church, okay? We got a few of us in here. I was raised a Roman Catholic. Now, in the Catholic church... They do not have where you bring your Bible and you come and they preach a sermon like we do here. They have what's called the Missalette. You guys remember that? It was a book that's in the pew in front of you. You take it out. You go to whatever date it is. Now, in this book, you can find, like, today is, what's today? The, the 12th? The 11th? 13th. 13th? You can find what is going to be for the service for April 3rd. You can go to April 3rd and you will find the, the whole layout of the whole service and it's because the whole Catholic Church, every single Catholic Church, goes by the same standard. That missalette, they just send it out to every single Catholic Church. This Sunday morning, whatever scripture reference that they went to, all the Catholic, the one that they went to here in Fort Worth, the Roman Catholic Church, they went to in Grand Junction, Colorado. That's the way that they work. Now, they'll have a bunch of rituals. They'll have what they call, like, I think it's called the homily, which is just like a little tiny sermon. And then they always go to the book. I remember only seeing the book of Mark. I don't know how come why they always only pick the book of Mark, but they always went to the book of Mark, and it literally, I mean, it was worse than a Baptist church. I mean, they would be lucky if you even got one verse out of these guys. And they would do the one verse, they would, they would he would just, it was pretty much he would say a joke. I remember the only thing I remember was the joke that the, that, the, that the priest would tell. And that little homily, the sermon would only last maybe five minutes. And the rest of it was just rituals and, and stuff like that. And a lot of the rituals that have to do with the Catholic Church have to do with idol worship and do with things that are not just unscriptural, but they are completely anti-biblical. They never teach their people anything. They don't even teach their people. I don't even remember learning why, as a Catholic, we did what we are supposed to do. I went through the whole catechism. I went through the whole everything. I mean, I grew up. I mean, I was you know almost an altar boy. And 
I literally was never told why we did what we did. We were all just kind of told, this is what we do. You just do what you do because that's what we do. It kind of had a lot to do with our heritage. And I remember my brother, when he left the Catholic Church, my brother got saved before I did. He left the Catholic Church. He got saved and he became a Baptist. He went to a fundamental Baptist church. And I remember he kind of broke the ice for my family. My dad was not happy at all that he left the Catholic Church. And um, when he went there, when he got saved, started going to church, he had some problems in his life. And when he started, he started straightening up, cleaning up his life. And you would think that the family would be real happy for him, but they were not. They would rather have him on drugs in the gutter, Roman Catholic, than living a clean and, and honest life with integrity, living, I mean, just living for what, for, you know, taking care of the family, paying, all that stuff, and be a Baptist. They, you know, be anything other than Catholic. And so by the time that I got saved, my dad had already been mad at him and had kind of seen a change in his life and kind of was just accepted that that's just, you know, another part of Christianity. And then when I came along and got saved, started coming to church, he kind of broke the ice. My dad kind of accepted it. But it is a forbidden thing for people to leave the Catholic Church. Now go to Exodus. You're in Exodus chapter number two, number twenty, number thirty-two. You say, well, what about the Ten Commandments? If you go to most Catholic churches, the Ten Commandments, they will have a statue of the Ten Commandments outside the church. At Saint Joseph's Catholic Church, was the biggest Catholic church that we went to in my, in my town. They would have standing room only. They'd have three services every Sunday morning. They'd have a Sunday evening services, and they would be standing room only, and they'd fit thousands of people in there. And they had a huge thing of the tablets of the of the Ten Commandments. And you think, why would they have the Ten Commandments if they also worship idols? Well, they take the Ten Commandments and the second commandment that tells you not to make an idol, they actually remove it. It goes commandment one, commandment three, four, five, but they don't they're not like the NIV where it just says like first commandment. Thing. They go first. They call the third commandment the second and the fourth commandment the third. And they actually split up the tenth commandment, the covetousness, into two commandments to fill it up to make ten. Now look down at verse number four. Now, so they'll make that, where it says not to, co not to covet your neighbor's wife. They make that a commandment. And then it says not to cover thy neighbor's, you know, thou shalt not covet is one commandment. And then the tenth commandment will be to not covet your neighbor's wife. So they kind of split it up. So they can still have ten, but they completely take out the graven images one. And the reason why is because they want their people also to be in darkness and they worship idols. Now, Catholics will say that the images that of Jesus Christ that they have and the images of Mary, you know, you go to them and say, why do you have an image? Why do you have a crucifix of, G of somebody that's supposed to be an image of Jesus Christ? Why would you even have that? And they'll say, well, we know that this image is not the Lord Jesus Christ. This image only just represents Jesus Christ. They'll say, of course the image is not. This is not a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's just an image that's supposed to represent the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, look at verse number 4. Exodus 32, verse number 4 says, And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with the graving tool after he had made a molten calf. So this is the children of Israel. They actually make a molten calf. Uh, and look, look. We'll just read. We'll just read what happens. And after they made a molten calf, they said, "These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt." And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, "Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord." So while Moses and Joshua were up on the mountain. Aaron, who's supposed to be the second in command, is down there with all the people, and he actually makes a molten calf. And he doesn't just say this is another god. He actually, well, let's, let's just keep reading. Look at verse number six. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go. Get thee down for thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. So God, everybody knew that the Lord is the one that brought them through the Red Sea. They made a molten calf. And they said, this is the God, this is your God that brought you up out of the land of Israel, or brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the people believed it. 
And you wonder, that's such a crazy thing. Every time I read, I think that's so bizarre. These are the same people who actually came through. They actually came through the water. And how can he build a molten calf and say this was the God? The reason why he can do it is because the Bible says that when it comes to the Lord, he disappeared in a, in a pillar of a fire and in a cloud of smoke. They saw no similitude. They did not know what God looked like when he built it. They can just say this is the God. Now, we don't know what the Lord Jesus Christ looked like. And so they build these little idols in order to represent the Lord Jesus Christ. Now go in your Bibles to Leviticus chapter number 10. Leviticus chapter number 10. Now, the same thing that they did in Exodus, they also did this also in 1 Kings when Jeroboam, actually it was, yeah, 1 Kings, Jeroboam actually makes a golden image and he makes a molten calf. He does identically what Aaron does in Exodus. He makes a molten calf so that way the people don't go down to Judah to worship, so they stay in Israel. He actually makes two of them. He puts one in, I think it's Samaria, and then one in Dan. And the people can go there and worship, and he says, These be thy gods that bring thee out of the land of Egypt. And that's what the Roman Catholic Church is doing, is they make molten images, and they say that they are the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, I mean, I don't know if, you know, it's hard to explain if you haven't been in it, but when you are a Roman Catholic, you have idols that you will pray to, and there are idols and there are uh, relics all around the world that are very famous. And people spend great deals of money in order to go see these things, to go touch these things, in order to kiss them. I mean, I remember having the, the, the rosary. And I remember when uh, we went through some hard times when I was little. And I remember we would, we'd, uh, when I would go to pray, I remember thinking to myself and kind of being under this assumption that if I did not have that rosary with me, that the Lord wouldn't even hear me. And we would ask the priest questions, and we would talk to them because at that time, they were they were they were uh, it was it was Father Andrew and uh, Father John Castillo, and then they spoke English, so I could talk to them. And then at the end, I, you know, we went to we went to Spanish church, and, and I couldn't understand what anything was saying. But anyway, uh, I would ask them questions about the rosary, ask them questions about prayer, and literally it was just like whatever you want to do, kid, you can do it. And God, you know, it is pretty much there was a, it was a it was a you had to be a part of it to do it. Now. I've, I lost my train of thought there. Look at Leviticus chapter number 10. So number one, we see that idol worship is a wicked thing. Now you're in Leviticus 10. Go back to Deuteronomy 27 real quick. Deuteronomy 27. Now, how does God feel about people that make idols, that make statues to worship statues and idols? Well, the Bible says that it's wicked. It's blessed. I mean, if you take the Ten Commandments, the First Commandment, the Second Commandment, all the way down, so on and so forth, I mean, I believe that they're almost ranked in order of importance. You know, I shall have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And it's the second commandment in the Bible. To take it out of there and then also teach people to do such a thing that the Bible says is blessed. Look at verse number 15. Cursed be the man that maketh any graven or molten image an abomination unto the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsmen, and putteth it in a secret place, and all the people shall answer and say... Amen. So the Bible says anybody that makes a graven image, the Bible says they will have a curse. The Bible says in the New Testament, if there's a New Testament believer that at home commits idolatry, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that if there's somebody that's an idolater and we find out that they pray to statues, they just cannot let go of their old religion and they keep praying to statues, they just got these idols in their house and they pray to them all the time, the Bible says that they should be thrown out of church. That's the severity that God has. Why? Because he said in, in Exodus 32, he's a jealous God. He said, my name is jealous. He does not want people to pray to anybody but him. And especially when it comes to an idol. Now look at Leviticus 10, verse number 8. Number one is they commit idol worship. Number two is they blaspheme communion. They blaspheme the Lord's Supper. Now look at verse number 8. And the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine nor strong drink. Thou nor thy sons with thee when they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest he die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, that you may put a difference between the holy and unholy, and between the unclean and the clean. The Bible says that when you if you that if we were to bring an alcoholic beverage into the congregation of the Lord, which in the New Testament is called the church. The Bible says that we are we are actually mixing the clean with the unclean, the unholy with the holy. Now, 
they actually, in the Roman Catholic Church, they serve real wine. Now, I knew a lady that worked at a liquor store one time, and she said that it was the same liquor store where St. Joseph's Catholic Church would go get their liquor, and they would buy those boxes of wine. You know what I'm talking about, the boxes of wine? And he'd buy like 20 of them. And at the end of the service, when you're watching them, when you're at the Catholic Church, everybody at the end of the service, they file up, they go down, they have the guy with the big golden chalice, and he, you take a drink, and then he wipes it with a little napkin, and he spins it around, he passes it to the next guy, and then you move, step to the side, and you're supposed to hold your hands in a certain way. You can't just be like, here, give me the cracker. And some people, it's so weird, they open their mouth and let the guy put it on their mouth, and his, his, his fingers all touching their tongues. It's disgusting. Anyway, and they, uh, you go there and they drink, the, they got all the wine, they got the guy with the cracker, and you kind of file up in single file line, then you go sit back down, you kind of wait for everybody to get done. And they will serve liquor to little children. I mean, you go up there, I mean, as soon as you're old enough to go through catechism and take your first unholy communion, they will let you walk up there and drink the wine. And the, by now, they are not, I don't think they're recognized as a church in the sight of God. But let's say that they were, let's say that they were, a, they, they call themselves, they call themselves Christian, they call themselves a church. The Bible says that, the Bible says that if you go into the tabernacle, the congregation with liquor, that God, it's you under the penalty of death. It says right there, lest ye die, that it should be a statute forever throughout your, your generations. Then what they would do is they have the one, they have all the guys with the liquor, and then have the guys with the, the crackers. Which always was weird to me because as soon as communion was done, they would all kind of huddle up, all the priests. And whoever was like the highest in command, the main father, he would go up and he had his big chalice, right? All the leftover that all these people have been drinking, all this backwash, they would all dump it into this big chalice, right? I mean, this big old cup. And he would down it and everybody would be watching him. <laughs> I am not kidding. He ain't drink at all. And he would, and he just, it would take him a little bit sometimes. And I always thought it was so weird as a little kid. I always thought to myself, how come they don't put all the crackers in one big thing and make him just eat them all? You know, why he, how come he only has to drink? How come he has to? It'd be funny to have to watch him sit there and eat all the crackers. You know what I mean? It's because the crackers don't get you drunk. The Roman, my dad said that when he was little, he had a job and it, I don't think he got paid any money, but he would sweep and clean the church. And he said, in the back of the church, all the priests would be out there playing cards, smoking cigars, drinking booze. Look, they have no regard for the things of God. They don't care what the Bible says. Look, there was no light in them. And he said that they would be back there doing all sorts of wicked things, all sorts of really things. He would go tell his dad, like, uh, tonight, you know, Father, whatever, so-and-so, the priest, they were getting drunk and they were fighting with each other. Because when you get drunk, you get all emotional. They start fighting with each other. They're cussing. They're doing all sorts of stuff. And his dad was just like, oh, well, whatever. What? You know what I mean? It's wicked. Now go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. They teach. Not only do they bring booze into the house of God. Now, obviously, again, it's not the house of God. They call it a church. But also, do they bring booze and they call it communion? They also say that the blood or the, the wine is actually literally the blood of Christ. And they say that the little the little crackers are also the body of the Lord Jesus. They say it's literally the body and it's literally the blood. They teach what's called transubstantiate. How am I saying it? Transubstantiate. Transubstantiation. They teach the Eucharist. <laughs> I get, I'm all fumbling around up here. But anyway, they teach that when you put that cracker in your mouth, between your mouth and your stomach. Somewhere there, it literally becomes the real life body of Jesus Christ. And when you drink the alcoholic wine, it literally becomes the blood of Jesus Christ. That's cannibalism. I mean, they're, they're saying that when you're drinking it, you're literally drinking the blood of Christ. Now look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 23. This is where we, we're, we're in the, the, the greatest part of Scripture outside the Gospels of the Lord's Supper. Look at verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the same, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. So he takes the, the bread, he breaks it, and then he says, This is my body which is broken for you. 
Look at verse 25. After the same manner also he took the cup. And when he had subbed, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, look at this, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. He was doing this while he was still alive. So by their thinking, even Jesus was drinking his own blood and Jesus was eating his own body, according to the Roman Catholic Church, if this is where he instituted the Eucharist. Look, if you look at verse number 26, it's for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. It's figurative. He's saying, look, this is my body which is broken for you. This is the cup of the New Testament, the blood. Why? Because it's red. Because it's just, it's a, it's a figurative. It's an illustration of the body and of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not meant to be literal. Now the Pharisees in John chapter 6, he told them, except you eat this meat by flesh and drink my blood, you cannot have eternal life. They thought he was out of his mind. Because they took him literally to mean like unless we, you know, start eating his flesh and drinking his blood, we can't be saved. And he was just letting them know this is just an illustration. Unless you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, you cannot be saved is what it's saying. Now go in your Bibles to Matthew chapter number 6. Matthew chapter number 6. It was a picture. It's an illustration. It's figurative of the, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. To say Now... This is the thing about the little crackers too. They're always round and they have a little cross on them. Now the Bible says that when Jesus took the bread, he break it. Why did he break it? Because why? Because his body was what? Broken. His body was broken. The bread was an illustration of his body. These are like perfectly round symmetrical crackers. Now who's ever been here when we did the Lord's Supper? You know, you've done it. Okay, you, of course you have done it. My, that's crazy. We have so many new people. Now... We actually make, my wife makes a thing of unleavened bread and we break it apart and tear it apart because it's supposed to represent, it's supposed to be broken pieces. That's why we don't drink milk and cookies. And you say, well, where the Bible doesn't say we have to drink bread and eat wine. Well, it doesn't say we have to, but they're symbolic of something. We use the illustration that Jesus Christ gave and what he gave was a broken piece of bread and he also gave us wine. Now, if the wine was alcoholic, that means it was fermented, means it's strong wine, which God said that we were not to bring into the congregation of the Lord. And then also it would mean, I mean, leaven, that's why it's unleavened bread, because leaven is always a symbolism of sin. Jesus Christ was broken. His body, he was, uh, he was without sin. He was tempted in all points like as we are, and yet without sin. His sinless body was broken for us, and then his sinless blood we receive and was shed, shed for us. Now, Go to Matthew chapter number 6. So we see that they blaspheme communion. They make communion out to be whatever they want. Now, I don't know where they got drinking the, the literal, like, real wine, like, real alcoholic strong drink. I don't know where they got that, but that's what they do. Therefore, when you try to show a Roman Catholic that them being a drunkard is sinful, it's a sinful life, you know what they say? Well, the priests drink. We drink at church. Yeah, you drink at church, and it's abomination to God at church. Yeah, and you should not be drinking alcoholic wine in anywhere that you would even call the, 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 the congregation. Vainly repeating prayers. Look at Matthew 6, verse number 7. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask them. He's saying, pray, use not vain repetitions, as the heathen do. Now, the Roman Catholic Church, they have their rosary beads. And who's ever seen a rosary bead? It's like a, the, the crucifix with a little idol, and then it's a bunch of beads. Those beads are not on accident. Those beads are on there on purpose. You'll see one of them by themselves, and then there'll be like three or four that are real close together, and then one by itself, and then three, four close together. The reason why is all the ones that are close together are supposed to be an Our Father prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, how you're supposed to pray for every bead, you have to recite that prayer. So if there's three rosary, three the three beads and continue. If you want to pray the rosary, you have to sit down, do a Hail Mary, and then do like three Our Fathers, just right in a row. And then a Hail Mary, 
and then three our fathers right in a row and then a helmet i remember doing that as a child and losing count of where i was at on the rosary and being afraid that i wasn't going to complete the whole thing and having to start all over and it's it's really you are vainly repeating prayers you're not even thinking you're just kind of reciting something and the bible says that's something that heathen do go to luke chapter number one while you're going there i'll, I'll read matthew 23 verse 9 it says, and call no man father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Calling a spiritual leader father is something the Bible says we should not do. It's actually blasphemous because the only spiritual leader that should be called father is the father that's up in heaven. You say, well, what if I call my dad father? Well, the Bible says that, the Bible actually refers to parents and, and the husbands and the dads as a father. I think this in the context is talking about a spiritual leader, a rabbi. You know, rabbi means teacher. You can call somebody a teacher. Don't come up to me and call me rabbi. Don't call. We've had people. We've even had people in this church every once in a while that were Catholic call me father a couple times. They they come. I've had, you know, there's sometimes that people will say like, "Hey, I'm sorry I missed mass this week." You know what I mean? Like, you know, I'm like, okay, you know, I know what they mean. They're just so you know. That's just the the, the terminology they use. But whenever somebody calls me father, or somebody's ever called a pastor of a church I went to father, I always correct them. Because what they're saying is blasphemous. I don't want them to keep doing it. They're doing it completely out of ignorance because that's just what they're told. Now look at Luke chapter number 1. And this is a big one. Mary worship. Mary worship. Luke 1 verse number 46. They teach that Mary, they call her the mediatrix. They believe that Mary was sinless. And that she was a perpetual virgin. And then once she had all of her children or when she had jesus she never had any more children and the bible's clear that she did have a bunch of children i don't have the the verses in there but the bible talks about jesus having a bunch of ch having brothers and sisters and then they came from joseph and mary now look at luke 1 verse number 46 to show that mary was not sinless mary needed a savior look at verse number 46 and mary said my soul doth magnify the lord and my spirit hath rejoiced in god my Savior, for he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden, for behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. Now go in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter number 43. Isaiah chapter number 43. This is what the Roman Catholic Church teaches about Mary. They pray, they believe this, that God, Jesus Christ up in heaven is angry because the world rejected him. He came unto his own and his own received him not. The majority of the world rejected the Lord. And up in heaven, he's angry. And he does not want to save. Mary comes to him in, as a mediator between man and Jesus Christ and pleads and begs for her son to please just save people and accept people. And that without her, there is no salvation. Now I'll read for you 1 Timothy 2.5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. The Bible says Amen. there's only one mediator. It's Jesus Christ. Mary was never a, a mediatrix. And I guarantee this, though. If she could look down from heaven and see this swarms and multitudes of people praying to her, having idols that represent Mary, I guarantee she's up in heaven saying, No! Don't worship me! I'm nothing! I'm a sinner! I'm a sinful person! You know, magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. She knew that Jesus Christ, amazing as it is to think about, that baby that she gave birth to was the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, and she knew that. She actually said that her spirit rejoiced in God, my Savior. If she was sinless, she would not need a Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ did not need a Savior. He was the Savior. Amen. If she was a Savior, if she was sinless, then she had, hey, the wages of sin is death. If she don't have no sin, then there's no wage, there's no death. Why would she even need a savior? Look at verse number 43. While you're going, Isaiah 43, verse number 10. Real quick, I'll read for you 1 John 2, 1. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's the mediator. Now, God up in heaven isn't up there all angry. Look. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, that all should come to He wants everybody to be saved. However, no man cometh unto the Father but by me, Jesus Christ, that He is the mediator. He is the way to get to heaven. Now look at Isaiah 43, verse number 10. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, my servant whom I have chosen, 
that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. The Lord up in heaven is saying that beside me there is no Savior. Hold your finger there and go to Philippians chapter number 2. Philippians chapter number 2. He said, besides me there is no Savior. Mary, and you say, well, who would say Mary's the Savior? Look, I'm telling you what, one time I knocked on a guy's door, and this guy was a smug, arrogant, and I knocked on the door, and he came, I could see him coming, the, the screen door was there, and he goes, can I help you? And I go, yeah, I'm here with uh, Faithful Word Baptist Church, and I was, you know, I was in Arizona. I just want to give you an invitation to my church. And he goes, you keep that. And I said, why? And he goes, my God's out there. And walking up, I saw the Mary statue. And I thought to myself, man, this guy's got some nerve. I said, your God's out there? And he goes, yep, that's my God. And I said, you worship a woman? And he goes, and he goes, yep. And he goes, and if you don't worship Mary, if you don't go out there and kiss her feet, you're going to die and burn in hell. And I gave him the screaming Raymond. I rebuked him in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, my friend. Why? Because that is blasphemous. That is wicked. There is one mediator. The advocate that we have is not Mary. It is Jesus Christ, the righteous, not Mary, the righteous. Now, am I saying that Mary isn't a righteous woman, a godly woman? I assume that at the time, she's probably one of the most godly women on the face of the earth. I mean, she's probably a very godly woman. That's why God even picked her in the first place. However, she is not. She was not God. She was a sinful person. Now, go to Isaiah chapter 45. You're in Philippians chapter number 2. Now, when you're in Isaiah 45, flip over to Philippians 2, and I'll give you a, a, a cool little thing that I got this week. Just thinking of, of weird Christian cults, think of the Jehovah's False Witness, right? Who they believe that Jesus Christ was a God, but they don't believe he is the God. And they change all the references to the Lord. They change it to Jehovah. You know, they take out the name Lord, and they insert the name Jehovah. Now, in the New Testament, the word for the... I'm not a Greek and Hebrew person, but I do know this one thing. The word for the word that they change into Jehovah in the New Testament is the Greek word kurios, okay? That word is all throughout the New Testament and they change it every time except for one time. Look at Philippians 2, verse number 9. Wherefore God hath also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is if they were going to be consistent, they would have to take out that word Lord and insert Jehovah. So if they were consistent with their teaching, it would say that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Jehovah to the glory of God the Father. But they don't want to do that because they have an agenda to be a Christ-denying and a false, a false religion. Now, that did you know that that verse is not a standalone verse? Did you know that's a quote from the Old Testament? Look at Isaiah 45, verse number 22. Verse number 22. Now, in the Old Testament quote, they don't take they actually insert the name Jehovah where it says Lord. So you can see in the Old Testament quote, it's the Lord talking about himself. Jehovah talking about himself. In the New Testament, it sheds some light on this. It says we're talking about Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the Lord. Amen. He is Jehovah God. Right. It's the same God. There is one God, one it's the same Lord. Beside me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I said, before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. There's no other gods. It's just one God. Now look at Isaiah 45, verse 22. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth, and righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall swear. That is the verse that's quoted in Philippians 2 when it says in the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the They can't even, they can't, they, it's a supernatural book, my friend. And they are blinded. There is no light in them. That's why they haven't caught that. And if you go to the Jehovah's Witness, their New World Translation, and you go back to Isaiah chapter number 45, it's, it's talking about Jehovah, but when it quotes it in the New Testament, they, change, they leave the word Lord in there and they just make him like a Lord, not the Lord. It's because they're a false cult. Now, we'll go back to the Catholic Church. Go to Leviticus chapter number 18. Leviticus chapter number 18. Now, while the church, let me say this, their head right now and their main proponent, and he's very popular, is Pope Francis. Okay? 
For a couple years, they had Pope, uh, uh, man, what was that guy's name? Pope uh, uh, Ratzenberger? Ratzinger. No, Ratzinger, <laughs> but he changed his name. It was, it was a, 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 John Paul was for a long time, and he was very, very popular. And then for two or three years, they had a Pope that when he got in there, they actually tried something. You know, sometimes churches will try, like, they'll have, like, they'll just try, like, fads, like a fad will happen. And I think the Catholic Church, they had this guy become Pope, and he was really gung-ho about being against the Sodomites, and he was real gung-ho about being, like, about old Catholic doctrine, and the, the Catholic world rejected him. Therefore, he's the first Pope that they forced to retire, and they bring in another Pope, Pope Francis, and Pope Francis is actually, did you guys know that he's the first Jesuit priest to become Pope? That before Pope Francis, the Jesuits were not even allowed to be Popes? They were not allowed? You say, what's a Jesuit? They're like the secret service of the Catholic Church. They're like the black army of the Catholic Church. They are, uh, they're like hitmen. They're satanic people. That's right. And, uh, and anyway, he became the Pope. Now this guy is a total liar and a total... Jesuits, they believe the Catholic doctrine to like their core, okay? I guarantee in his heart, he's probably just so pro-Catholic, old Latin doctrines, all this type of stuff. However, he is willing to lie to make everything kind of ecumenical and bring people back. He's trying to bring people back into the fold. Now, I'm going to read for you. Uh, they actually, he's been named the humble pope. Did you know that two years ago... No, yeah, two years ago in 2014, he actually, there's some Sodomite magazine that made him the person of the year because he's the first pope to get up and just say that being a Sodomite is perfectly fine and you can still go to heaven and be, be a queer. I'll read for you this. This is an excerpt from, a, from a, a, a magazine. It says, while the church has long been long opposed the sanction of homosexuality, Pope Francis seemingly contradicted his predecessor, Pope Benedict. That was his name. In saying something that also is a direct odds with the American evangelical Christian doctrine, which has spilled over into di divisive U.S. Pot political arguments. So he's pretty much coming out and saying that God changes with the times. And he said, if someone is gay and searches for the Lord and has good will, who am I to judge? Now, while the church has long opposed the sanction of homosexuality, Pope Francis has seemingly contradicted his predecessor. Now, go in your Bible. Uh, you go to uh, chapter number 18. Look at this. Pope Benedict spoke more about the catechism of the church as it relates to gay members, adding, The catechism of the Catholic Church explains this very well. It says they should not be marginalized because of this, but that they should be integrated into society. So he's saying that the Sodomites, at one time, they entered, that the Catholic Church was supposed to be against them. But what he's kind of said is that as times go, as society develops, and we become more and more advanced, that, you know, God changes along with us. And what was wrong, you know, 100 years ago may not be wrong today because of just looking. I mean, look, good night, 2016, there's so many, there's so many freaks and weirdos. You know, it's got to be okay. God's got to just be cool with it. He can't just be so condemning and so mean. Now look at Leviticus 18, verse number 21. God says, I am the Lord and I change not. He says, and the Bible says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Look, what the Bible says is not ever going to change. And I'll read for you this. Look at Leviticus 18, verse number 21. And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire unto Molech, Neither shalt thou profane the name of the Lord thy God. I am the Lord, thou shalt not lie with mankind, as thou lieth with womankind. It is an abomination. Neither shalt thou lie down with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down thereto. It is confusion. The Bible says that sodomy, that being a queer, is something that is punishable by death. Now, what the Roman Catholic Church is doing is they believe that they're big on uh, the papal bull, which is a lot of bull. You know what I mean? Or they believe that they can get together as a big congregation and they can vote on what is still right and what is wrong and what gets voided and what gets not voided. Now go in your Bibles to John 14, verse number 6. John 14, verse number 6. Now, they believe that at, just like everything else, that, that if this is what they think. And you know, so honestly, a lot of a lot of evangelicals and a lot of Christians believe this too. Even saved Christians believe that because there's so many, that God just gives in. 
Like if we can get a bunch of people, just a, so many people to do a certain sin, that God just kind of gives in, throws up his arms, and just says that it's okay. Now let me ask you a question. How many people in here have ever told a lie before? Okay. How many people in the world do you think have told lies? Everybody. So by that thinking, because everybody's done it, is God just okay with lying? They won't say that. But because there are so many sodomites coming out of the closet, becoming so prevalent in, in the world today, they feel like because they, they people are brainwashed and they think that God just looks down and he says that it was wrong and then now because so many people are doing it that it just makes it okay. Now I'll read for you uh, a thing from him. You're going to John chapter number 14. The Bible's clear that sodomites are worthy of death. It's not anything. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1 that they're worthy of death. The Bible says in the book of Jude that they're filthy beasts. And I mean, it's 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 pretty cut and dry. Now, another thing that Pope Francis has said is that everybody can go to heaven without Jesus Christ. He literally said it. And this is something that has made him very popular. Responding to a list of questions published by a paper, um, Pope Francis wrote, if you ask me if the God of the Christians forgive those who don't believe and who don't seek faith, I start by saying, this is, the fu this is the fundamental thing, that God's mercy has no limits. And if you go to him with a sincere and contrite heart, the issue for those who do not believe in God is to obey their conscience. So he's saying if these people that don't believe in God, as long as they obey their conscience, they're good. That means that their conscience is their own God. And if they just, if you just do what, if every man just does with that, which that which is right in their own eyes, they're good, is what he's saying. And they say right there that you do not have to believe in Jesus Christ. You just obey your conscience. Now look at John 14, verse number 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So Jesus is saying nobody's going to the Father up in heaven unless it's through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, go in your Bibles. Man, it's got so much. I'm never going to get to all this. Go to Colossians chapter number 2. Colossians chapter number 2. The Bible says in Acts chapter 4, verse number 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's not through Mary. It's not through the Pope. It's not through the Catholic Church. And in culmination to all this, I'll say this about the Catholic Church, is again, I was raised in a Catholic Church. They teach very little doctrine. Now, being taught soul winning, when I first started going soul winning by somebody that was never in a Catholic Church, we were taught that when you come across somebody that's a Catholic, you have to combat all their Catholic doctrines. But this is a fact. If you go out there and do real soul winning and you actually talk to people, very little Catholics even know what they believe. If you ask Catholics, what do you think you have to do to go to heaven? Other than that one guy, and maybe I, I leave room for another person I've never even met. I don't even know if I know two or three people that have ever told me that salvation was only through the Catholic Church. They all just believe it's by good works. So you say, what do I need in order to be able to evangelize a Roman Catholic? All you need to be able to do is just be able to preach the gospel. Yeah. It's because most of them, they, they don't, they're not going to tell you, oh, it's because I'm a good Catholic or it's because of Mary. They really honestly don't have any idea. They're not really taught doctrine. They're kind of, everything is left up to themselves to where they just feel like it's just through their good works. So we don't need to, you know, you don't need to learn any, any you know, brand new gospel of that now you guys go to you guys are in Colossians chapter number two I'll just give you a little uh, tidbit of something kind of cool that the Catholic Church uh, just different things that the Catholic man there's so many different false doctrines and stuff like that 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 if you realize that all these false doctrines in society were started by Catholic did you know the Big Bang Theory is started by a Catholic priest that the Bible uh, the history shows that there's a guy named George George's Lemaitre I don't know He's from the Catholic University of Leuven. He's also describes as a, a he had, he came up with the theory of the cosmic egg exploding at the moment of creation. A Catholic priest came up with the Big Bang theory. As a Catholic priest, and there's a, there's a whole bunch of them. I can give them to you after the service if you want. It's getting kind of late. Now look at Colossians two verse number eight. It says, "Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit." after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. The point of tonight's sermon is to warn you, look, Catholics may seem, don't let anybody tell you that Catholics are Christian. There was a day when I remember Catholics wouldn't even call themselves Christian. They would say, are you Catholic? Are you Christian? Because there was a, there was a division. 
even amongst false Christianity. But today the lines are being blurred. Just because somebody calls themselves a Christian does not mean, mean that they believe any part of the Bible. Look, the Catholics don't believe any part of the Bible. I know Catholics and I've showed them different things in the Bible. And I told them, go to your priest and, and, and ask them what they think about this. And their priests deny the scripture. The priests are just like, whatever you feel, whatever you think. I know a guy that goes to the confessional booth every single week. And he confesses his sins to the priest every single week. And he asks them, what do you think I should do? And it's just, go vainly repeat a bunch of prayers. You got 25 Our Fathers. You know, they'll even, look, I know they even do indulgences where they have you sign thing. I had a family member. They just did a seance for her. And hopefully she's saved. But... Don't let anybody spoil you through philosophy and don't let anybody, just because someone's called a Christian, you know, don't just buy into it. Don't just believe it. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the, the service today. Lord, thank you for uh, your word. And I want to thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving us, Lord, for being our mediator, Lord, for dying for us once and for all. Father, I want to pray, pray and ask that you bless the food that we're going to eat, Lord. Bless the fellowship and... Uh, Help the folks that have traveled afar to get here, Lord, to get home safe and sound. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.